Our guest speaker today is Dr. A.B. Brown. Uh, he is my father in the Lord. Some of you met him a couple of years ago whenever he was here. We had a uh, service outdoors at the, um, at the new property, and he preached on heaven. I actually had a conference that he was holding on, on heaven here. And um, I explained then exactly what he means to me, but for those of you who have never heard, I will let you know. When I was 19 years old, I had actually failed the 12th grade twice. Uh, <laughs> Father, forgive him. <laughs> that was just cold. <laughs> I got freezer burn from that one. Thank you. Uh, spent a little bit too much time partying in high school. And uh, anyway, I was basically headed nowhere in life. And a friend of mine named Daryl Grimes invited me to go to church with him, and so I finally went. And it was Haven Free Will Baptist Church in Raleigh, North Carolina. And Brother Brown was the pastor there. He was the academic dean uh, at a local Bible college and pastored this church as well. And he preached the gospel. He was actually preaching on hell that day. And I had never, I had never heard the gospel at least never to, in a way that I understood it until that day. And so when the end of the service came, uh, he, he told everyone to bow their heads and close their eyes, at which time I did that. And he said, if you want to be right with God and have a relationship with him and go to heaven when you die, then you need to admit that you were a sinner. Ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins and to come into your heart and life to be your Savior and Lord. And so I, I immediately did that in my pew. Everyone's heads were bowed and their eyes were closed. And so I started praying and asking the Lord to save me. What I didn't know, Papa Jay, was that while that was going on, he was giving an altar call. But I wasn't really paying attention to that because I was doing business with God in my seat. And I looked up and, and people were leaving. And this guy, I wish I could remember his name, but he came up to me and he said, you know, you don't have to leave here lost. Uh, I don't remember what I said. I was probably something like, okay, thanks, you know. I, I left and went on my way. My buddy Daryl, he asked me, he said, well, how did you, how'd you like church? And I said, man, it was great. He said, we need to go talk to the preacher. So I said, okay. So we went out to the college and had a nice conversation. Brother Brown said, Steve, you need to, you need to be saved. You need to admit that you're a sinner. Ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins and to come into your heart and life, be your Savior and Lord. I said, well, I did that last Sunday. He said, well, how do you feel? The only thing I'd known really about Christianity up until that point, I was a Christian because I wasn't a Muslim. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Um, and so I said, I did that last Sunday. He said, well, how do you feel? I said, well, you know, uh, I didn't see any bright lights. I didn't hear any angels singing uh, or anything. I said, but I felt the most amazing peace I've ever known. I said it was like the weight of the world had been lifted off my shoulders. He said, well, Steve, if you meant that, then that means you're saved. Amen. And I was like, man, is that what you call it? I'd never heard of being saved before. Uh, within a couple of weeks, I went up to him and I said, I think that God wants me to be a pastor. I'd never heard of being called to preach before. Again, altogether new to me. He was very wise in what he said. He said, Steve, he said, uh, he said, I appreciate what you told me. He said, why don't you just hang out with me for a while? He said, you can go with me on visitation. Uh, I'll, I'll teach you some things about how to follow Jesus. You just be faithful to church. You know, when, whenever the doors are open, you be there. He said, and at the end of a year, if you, still, if you still feel that way, then we'll talk about it more. So that's exactly what happened. Uh, the cool thing is he, he let me start doing some Christian service. I'd never heard of starting a bus route before, but someone had donated a van to the church and I said hey can I take that van out and go pick up some kids and carry them to church he said yeah and I mean God just moved I don't know if you remember this or not it was a long time ago um, but when everything was said and done sometimes I would be running three routes in that 15 pastor van on a Sunday morning I remember having upwards of 50 kids in children's church off of one van uh, so God just blessed it was amazing but here we are 24 years later 
And uh, Brother Brown has, he serves at North Laurenburg uh, Southern Baptist Church now as their interim pastor. He was instrumental in me becoming a Southern Baptist years ago. And he's been faithful to the Lord for a long time. Uh, he served as an academic dean. Uh, he's an adjunct professor at Liberty University right now. And he's taught ancient Greek, uh, theology, uh, church history, among other subjects. But beyond all that, he loved me enough to tell me the truth. And he loved me enough to invest his time in me. And I will forever be grateful for God using him to be the human instrument in my salvation. And so it's an honor to have him today. And so if you would give him a warm Mount Lebanon Baptist Church welcome. It's, a, it's an honor that God used me to touch Steve and save him. So it's a, uh, I'm blessed by Steve. Steve's blessed by me. It's a, it's a two-way street. He's a, <clears throat> turned out to be a very capable preacher and a good pastor. And uh, I'm proud of him as one of my preacher boys. And so uh, and, and God gave him a good wife. Where's Hannah? She... Uh, she back stayed and go home? No, I'm just picking. No, God gave him a good wife and a good little boy, David. But at any rate, it's good to be in the Lord's house. Amen? I'm glad you're here. <clears throat> and uh, if you come back tonight, I'm going to be preaching on who is you. I know that isn't good grammar, but you'll remember that. <laughs> who is you? So you want to find out who you is, who you are, come back tonight. And I'll polish it up with a little better grammar tonight. Amen? So I hope you'll be back tonight. Uh, and if you'll open your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, we'll, uh, we'll begin there. Matthew, chapter 6, verse 9. Matthew 6, 9. My wife is always on me for not giving folks enough time to find the passage. So, uh, it's page 1145. Just joking. I know you've got a different Bible than me. But anyway, um, we're going to be looking at a part of what is called the Lord's Prayer. Now, uh, in the year of 350, Cyprian, who was Bishop of Carthage, gave this passage the name, the Lord's Prayer. The 65 words in the King James Bible. Five verses in the Lord's Prayer. And it became known universally to, as the Lord's Prayer. And we pray it and we sing it. But this is interesting. It is never quoted in the New Testament again as a prayer or as a song. What I'm saying is, if Jesus meant this as a short prayer to be memorized and quoted and said as a prayer, the disciples didn't get the memo. And none of the rest of the New Church, nobody in the New Testament church got it because nobody in the book of Acts ever prays this as a prayer. So obviously, Jesus did not intend it to be a short prayer to be memorized and quoted, and nothing wrong with doing that. There's nothing wrong with singing it. It's still the Word of God. But it, it's, there's a misconception about what's going on here. And I'd like to uh, say today that this is Jesus' instructions on how to pray and what to pray about, but not the words you're supposed to say. Because uh, again, there's 65 words in this, uh, what we call the Lord's Prayer. But uh, uh, he, he's given, this is a good, this is a, if there's a summary of the Christian life, in the New Testament, it's found right here. If there's a summary of how God expects you to pray and live, it's given by Jesus in these five verses. And uh, in fact, I've got a book coming out in about three weeks called Practical Christianity 101. It's based on this passage. Uh, so I want us to look at it. And we're just going to look at, there's, there's seven guides in this passage. 
on how to pray and how to live. Now, here's my assertion about, on, on thing about living. If Jesus tells me in here, when you pray, pray, thy will be done or your will be done. If Jesus expects me to pray guided by the will of God, he expects me to live guided by the will of God. Amen? If he says to me, you pray, give me this day my daily bread, he expects me to live dependent upon God. I'm not just to pray dependent upon God for my daily bread. I'm to live that way. And so uh, every command, every instruction is given in here as a guide on both how to pray and how to live. So we're going to look at the first three today. <coughs> uh, I can do this for you. The first one tells me that I got to know Him, our Father. You, can't know, you, you cannot know God as Father to you if you're born again. So I got to know Him. Second one, glorify His name. Hallowed be Thy name. I got to know Him. Glorify His name. Second one is Thy kingdom come. And we'll explain that in a few moments. That means to make Him known. And that, those are three things I've got to do. That's the things God expects me to do, Jesus expects me to do as a believer. And then the, the last four are things He expects me to be. Uh, he says, uh, uh, Thy kingdom come, Thy will done. I'm supposed to be submissive to Him, to His will, okay? And then it says, Give us this day our daily bread, that I'm to, to be dependent upon Him for everything. By the way, the word daily bread stands for everything, all my needs. I'm totally dependent upon God for all my needs. So I'm to be submissive. I'm supposed to be dependent. Forgive us our debts. We forgive our debtors. I'm supposed to be forgiven. And I'm also supposed to forgive others. And then I'm supposed to be an overcomer. At least not temptation, but deliver from evil. I'm to overcome temptation. So there's three things I'm to do, four things I'm supposed to be as a believer. We're going to look at the three, three things I'm supposed to do uh, this morning. So he says, first of all, you pray, Our Father who art in heaven. Now, again, I've already mentioned this, and I will deal with this more tonight and, and explain this in deeper tonight. But when he says, Pray, Our Father in heaven, uh, we know from the rest of the Bible that I will never be able and authorized to address God as my Father until I'm born into His family by new birth. I'm not a child of God by physical birth. I'm a child of God by spiritual birth. And so the, the first guide is, is, the first step in your life is you need to get right with God. This is the most important, by the way, this is the most important relationship in the world. Coming to know God as your father is the most important event in your life. Amen? And so uh, he says, okay, first thing I want you to do is to know God I want you to know Him as your Heavenly Father. Then it says, Hallowed be your name. Now, again, the word hallowed in the original language literally means this. Uh, hallowed be your name, or sanctified be your name, or reverence be your name, as holy, respected be your name, as holy. The word comes from a, a word that has to do with holy. The root word, hallowed, is holy. And so... Uh, it's most often translated, in fact, it's only translated as how two times. That's in the, what's called Lord's Prayer here in Luke. Every, every time else, in, in every other place, it's translated as holy, sanctified, or something of that nature. So what he's saying is, once you come to know God as your Father, the next thing about your life is, you're supposed to live your life to glorify God's name as holy. Now, I know that is a popular in today's church world. Uh, you watch television and uh, very few folks ever talk about holiness anymore. The words sin and hell have almost been banned from the American pulpit. But when he says, hallowed be thy name is holy, he's saying God expects me to glorify his name. But listen, unholy people cannot glorify a holy God. Amen? Unholy people cannot hallow the name of a holy God. So he says, first of all, you've got to come to know God as your father by being born in the family. Secondly, when you, when you become born in the family, the glory of God becomes the guiding principle of all of your life. Now here's, 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 here's what, you know, Paul says, whether you eat or drink, whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. 
All right? That means that the glory of God is to guide me in every decision in life I make. It's become the driving force of my life. Any decision I make today, I must ask myself, will this glorify the name of Jesus who bought me on Calvary? If it will not glorify the name of God, it's off limits. Any deed I anticipate doing today, by the way, uh, that, that changed a whole lot of things if we stop and do that. When, when somebody ticks you off, if you just stop saying, now, what would Jesus do? Most time you know, amen? <laughs> a lot of times you don't want to do what Jesus wants you to do, but you know. But my thing is, when he says, hallowed be thy name, that should become, and that is, the driving force of every believer's life. I'm to live my entire life subject to the glory of God. Will it glorify God? Then the next thing he says is, uh, your kingdom come. And the word kingdom there is a, is a word which literally means this. The primary meaning of it in the original language is this. I mean, it has to do with the rule and the authority of the king. Okay? Now let's bring down, Jesus said, for example, for example Jesus says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is hand. He, he wants you to get into the kingdom, but you've got to repent. He says, repent, believe. So uh, again, my thing is, uh, the kingdom is, is a kingdom that's built by evangelism, and Jesus came preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And went, 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 went around preaching, the Bible is really strong about that in the gospels. So, uh, how do you and I, thy kingdom come? What does that mean to me today? How do I advance the coming of the kingdom of God? I do that by, guess, when I lead somebody to Jesus, he comes into their heart as the Lord and Savior, and he becomes the authority and the ruler of their life. So I have advanced the kingdom. I've advanced the coming of the kingdom every time I get someone saved. So I, I hope we can make this connection. And, uh, and again, that's one of those things that... Uh, it's kind of fallen out of favor in uh, today's church. Uh, I mentioned this earlier this morning. We as a Southern Baptist Convention, uh, I'm, I'm going to go back, to, I, I don't have the statistics right in front of me, but I've got them in my, in my manuscript. Uh, we have now a lot, somewhere around 40,000 more churches than we had like in 1985-86. We made about 200,000 less converts last year than we did in 1985. So something's gone wrong. Somewhere we've jumped the track. And uh, I, uh, in those days it took 11 church members to get one person saved. Now it takes 40. Big difference. What I'm trying to say again is, uh, I know it's an old, old story. And, and you know, uh, I have, a, I, I, I grew up in church. I've, uh, my mother, my, I, my mother and dad got saved when I was a small child. And I grew up in church. I went to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. And if they had something going on between that, I went then. If the doors of the church squeaked, I was there to hear it squeak. So, so and by the way, it's good for me. I'm not complaining. But my point again is this. So, so I grew up in church, and I've heard, I've heard about soul winning. And by the way, again, that, that word's gone. <laughs> it's now uh, discipleship. And it's okay. The terminology's changed, and I don't have any problem with that. I'm, I, I've tried, at, at 80 years of age, I try not to live in the past. <laughs> I try to tr sort of kind of stay up with the times. So I know where I live and what, I, and what I'm doing. You know, I'm in communication. The average person in my class is at liberty is 39 years of age. I mean, the average age. I mean, I have some 19. I have, grand, I have a grandmother last, last semester, I believe, had 14 grandchildren taking my class, theology class. So I have uh, of all ranges. So I tr do stay in contact with what's going on in the world today. But my point against this is, I'm not up here today. I didn't come down here to beat you over the head. See, I know you're in a building program. You're going to be building a, a new building. I've been through that four times. And uh, I, I have 
the first church out of college, I went there, they had about 20 people. God built it to a, a pretty good sized church. And we built a brand new building down by the interstate. I know, what, I know the excitement. And we, by the way, we built it ourselves. We didn't hire it out, we built it ourselves. It took about a year and a half, two years to do it, but we did it for about half price. But my point again, I'm not making any suggestions about that. <laughs> I'm not, I, I just don't go there. <laughs> but don't, don't do it unless you have to do it. But my thing is, we did it. And we built, that church would seat about 200, 250. We built a church over in North of Virginia Beach, area of Virginia Beach, that'll seat 1,500. And we had, uh, and when we built church, we had about 1,000 in attendance. And we, by the way, we built ourselves. Uh, we built a family life center down in Durham, uh, and we built it ourselves. We had about 150, 200, 175 going to that church. And uh, we built a, 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 another church. I'm just trying to remember. <laughs> so, but my point was this. I've been through these programs. I know the excitement. I know the labor. I know what's involved. And uh, I know that, that uh, here's, here's what we always want to do. This is our dream. We get this church built, we're going to fill it up. I mean, it's going to be a beautiful building, a handy location, blah, 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 you know. And there's an excitement. There ought to be. There ought to be an excitement about God blessing us and prospering us and building a new building in a good location. And, and I've been to your side and all this kind of thing. And I'm glad of it. So, but my thing is this. Okay. When we get there and we move in and have dedication service, what's going to happen after that? See, are we going to grow a church? Now, there's a difference between building a crowd and building the church. Now, we can create a, a show up here in entertainment with the flashing lights and the smog and all those kind of things and have a show and entertain folks and draw a crowd, but we're not building a church. Now, I'm not against contemporary music. We're not going there. So that's not, that's not my point. My point is, we want to build the kingdom of God. Amen? We're here to get folks saved born again, and get them into the kingdom of God. We're not here just to attract the crowd, and we won't do that. Nothing wrong with desiring to attract the crowd and doing things to get a crowd. I don't have any problem with that. Now, I'm not going to do... I've heard people... I've heard preachers eating dinner off the roof of the church. I'm not going there. I've heard preachers eating goldfish. I'm not going there. If you if your preacher wants to eat goldfish, let him swallow goldfish. But my thing is... But, but we do want to get people in church. Amen? And so I... <laughs> but I, I'm not making any of those suggestions. I'm just simply saying, but my, my point is, we ought to love people and get, want to get people in church. Amen? So, but what are we going to do with them when we've got them here? Are we going to entertain them or are we going to teach them the Word of God and get them born again and get them into the kingdom of God? So, my, see, here's, here's Jesus. The Bible says this about Jesus. For, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Amen? For the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. The angel told Joseph before he was born, you shall call his name Jesus and he shall save his people from their sins. The last thing Jesus told the church before he went back to heaven, the disciples was, and you shall be witnesses unto me. And Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. So we know what our calling is. Amen. We know what the Great Commission is given five times in the New Testament. We know that. So we, don't have to, we, you know, we know all that. But my thing again is this. Is I, I want to just take this passage. Jesus says now, you're to pray and to live that the kingdom of God might come. Here's, here's one of the things. I saw this on a, a, a bulletin in front of a, a sign from a church the other day. It's, it's been a few weeks ago. It says, if you've got a pulse, you've got a purpose. Well, what is my purpose? What did God lead me here for? What am I doing here? After all, I get this. You're living on God's earth. I'm living on God's earth. I'm breathing His oxygen. I'm eating His food. I'm drinking His water. The next beat of my heart comes from Him. The next blink of my eye comes from Him. The next brainwave I get comes from Him. I'm living in His hands, totally at His mercy. And so, why? He left me here for a reason. Why? Did He leave me here just to be here? So, my thing is, no. No, He left us here for a purpose. And the purpose is to fulfill the Great Commission. 
Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. So, so that's the purpose of Mount Lebanon Baptist Church. We all know that, amen? Now, here's, here's, uh, here's one. This is a very important issue that we need to get settled in our minds and hearts today. Every, every group, I don't care if it's a church or whatever group it is, if it's a group of people, there has to be an organizing cause or principle that holds them together. Okay, what is the organizing cause and the principle that holds Mount Lebanon Baptist Church together? What is the driving force and the driving cause behind this church? What do we want to accomplish when we come to church on Sunday morning? What is our goal? What's it all about? Did, did I come just to get a cup of coffee and the fellowship? There's nothing wrong with that. Did I come here singing? Nothing wrong with that. Did I come here? No, nothing wrong with that. But my point again is, what, what draws us together? What ties us together as a body? There has to be a cause that drives us, that holds us together. Now, all of us are born again, amen? But that doesn't, that doesn't mean, we, that, that doesn't draw us together. Uh, and by the way, there's nothing beats Christian fellowship. <laughs> Been down that road and tried everything the world had to offer before I got saved. Nothing beats Christian fellowship and knowing Jesus, your Lord and Savior. But my point again is this. So now, here, I want to go back to the Lord's Prayer here. Uh, here's, what make, here's the cause of this church. And you, if, you don't, if you're writing your Bible, you need to write this down. God, you and I in this church exist to know Him, to glorify Him, that's the second principle, hallowed be thy name, and to make Him known. That's what this church exists for. To know Him, to glorify Him, and to make Him known. And that's what this church is all about. That's what your life's all about, what my life's all about. Now, my question is, if I'm to make Him known, how do I do that? And when I say this, when I say witness, you know, I've sat on the pew where you are. I've been, I've been, and, but here's the deal. Here's the first thing the devil whispered to you when I look. First of all, you're too old. Secondly, you don't have enough training. You might mess up. Somebody might ask you a question you don't know the answer. Uh, somebody might get angry with you. They might get a little ticked off at you if you try to witness to them. Or you, you just don't have enough schooling. You don't have enough Bible training. If you, just, you just need to spend a little more, a few more years in the Word, and I'll be able to handle it. Now, am I, am I touching the bases? Is that where we live? All right, now, I, I, wanna, I want to take you to the Gospel of Mark. I want you to turn to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5. I want to kind of put that away, put all those things away. I'm going to lay them to rest today. And we can walk out of here with a different idea about talking to folks about Jesus. Okay? So Mark chapter 5, verses 18 through 20. And uh, this is Jesus talking to the Gadarean demoniac. That he just cast a legion of demons out of him. And uh, Jesus fixed to leave town. And the, the demoniac wants to go with him. So, Mark... 5.18 And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might go with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. I want to pause here. How long has this guy been saved? Three years or five years? Has he been to Bible college? Has he even been to Sunday school? Has he ever attended a Sunday school class? No, he just got saved. He's just been saved uh, uh, at most a few hours. So he's a brand new convert. And Jesus said to him, you can't go with me and the disciples. You go back home to your family and friends and tell them what great things God's done for you and had compassion on you. So here's what I'm trying to say. Jesus 
commissions a brand new convert to become a testimony and a witness for him. Now that's, that's contrary to all of our thinking. Amen? Now I, I got to know all the answers before I can talk to folks about Jesus. What's wrong with saying I don't know the answers to that? But if you'll give me a chance, I'll look it up. I'll find it. I'll let you know. I, I, I do that. I, I've been, you know, I've got an earned doctorate. But I don't mind saying to you, I don't know the answer to that. But if you'll give me a chance, I'll try to figure it out or hunt it up or, you know, but my point again is this. So when, when I'm talking to folks about Jesus, and, and a lot of times they'll do that, try to get you off track. You just say, well, we'll come back to that later. But my thing is this. So Jesus is telling this new convert. He said, now, number one, He's saying to, we're going to call him Legion, okay? He's saying, Legion, you got to make a choice now. You're just going to spend time in fellowship with me or are you going to go out and get busy winning folks to Jesus? Which one's going to be? I know you want to go with me. It'd be nice to fellowship me and the disciples. I understand all that. Nothing wrong with that. But he said, i got a priority for you. I want you to go back home. <clears throat> so, Legion, it's, it's, it's decision time now. It's choice time. Go back home to your family and your friends, or to your friends, which includes his family. So here's what he's saying. Pick you out somebody. What about your mother, Legion? Does she know the Lord? I sort of suspect she did. I really do. I, I, I really believe that that mother had prayed for that, that man for a long time. I just sort of think mama knew the Lord. And probably dead. But my point is, he says, you go back home. And you tell your family and friends what God did. So, so pick them out. The guy across the street. But tell your friends what great things God done. So now here's, here's the program. When God expects me to testify to somebody, I don't have to have, you know, we, we hear about the Romans Road and the faith program and all these programs. Now, I'm, I'm not against any of those things. A guy told me one day, he said, that's a package deal. I said, at least I, at least I got a deal. Amen? <laughs> you know, uh, my thing is, it's a canned pitch. I said, at least I got a pitch. But, but my thing is, uh, but Jesus said, I'm not worried about the Romans Road. I'm not worried about the faith program. I, you just need to go back home and tell folks what God did for you. So that's what God expected me of you today. So, uh, so how do I witness? I tell folks how I got saved. That's how, that's how I witness. I tell folks what God did for me. That's how I witness. So if, 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 if I go out to lunch today and a guy, I get a conversation with a guy and we kind of get an opportunity to talk, I say, let me tell you what Jesus did for me one time. Would you, will you give me just three minutes of your time? Let me, let me tell you what Jesus did for me. And by the way, I'm glad to brag on Jesus, aren't you? He's the best person I ever met. He changed my life. He turned my world upside down. He changed my eternal destiny. He's been my good friend now for a good long time. And so, yeah, I like to brag on him. And we ought to look for every chance we can to brag on Jesus. Amen? And so, uh, so neighbor, if you give me just a moment, let me just tell you what Jesus did for me. And be excited about it. I'm excited. I still love telling folks about Jesus. It's been uh, 62 years. But my point again is this is, uh, share your gospel story of how God saved you. And you don't have to make it, you know, con can get it down to something where you don't go. You don't have to give every little detail. Well, we was in a church that had red pews and, and had green carpet and, and, and the preacher preached on so and so and, and my mother was there and my dad. He, he didn't and all that stuff. Give the core message of how I got saved. Amen. Hone it down, get it, put it together, and sharpen your axe and get it ready. And so, if you say, when you get a chance to talk to somebody, let me tell you what Jesus did for me. And just say, look, and tell the story how God convicted you, and you realize you're lost, and you're going to go to hell. And Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins. And He says, if, if you'll repent of your sins and trust in me and ask me to come into your heart. Believe in me, the resurrected, glorified Lord. I'll save you and forgive your sins. Put your name in the book of life and take you to heaven when you die. And he'll do the same thing for you, Doc. And that's real simple. Amen. My point, my point again is, that's what Jesus told this guy to do. And that's what he tells us to do. Now, I realize we live in a changing world. Uh, 
when I, in my early days as a pastor, I could go down the street, knock on the door, and get into a lot of houses. And one lot of folks to Jesus, just knocking on doors, going to the house, and sharing the God. You can knock on the door now, guy sitting in front, watch TV, watch TV, he look out the door, window, and see you, and never even get up, never even answer. He just watch the TV, like you're not even there. But you still, that still works. If it, if it didn't work, Mormons wouldn't be doing it, Jehovah's Witnesses wouldn't be doing it. So you still can do that. It's a lot harder. It takes a lot more door knocking. Uh, but my point again is this, there, there may be other ways. So what works in one town might not work in another town. What works in one church might not work in another church. I'm not trying to, but, but this personal testimony works with everybody. So my point again is this, is that hadn't changed. So, so I, 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 uh, I realize we live in a changing world and things change right now. I think that one of the things we have to do in today's world, and I've been doing this now for years, um, you, need to, you need to pick you out somebody and just ask God to put them on your mind and your heart. That, that personally, that I need to talk to about Jesus. And you decide I'm going to be their friend. I, I took a church as a pastor s- several years ago, Southern Baptist Church, and um, this lady in the church, good woman, her husband never came to church. Come and find out, he and I were teenagers at the same time. We didn't buddy together, but I knew him, he knew me. We were teens. We probably dated some of the same girl and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, he had become a very successful businessman, retired, and all blah, blah, blah. But anyway, so I got his, their address and everything, so I started visiting him. I went and talked to him about it. Witness to him. In fact, I, I, I've typed out a five-page presentation of the gospel after I already talked to him. Carried to him and said, Rex, read that. And he read it. He still got it, by the way. But he had, Rex still on I've been working on Rex now six, uh, six years. He's still unsaved. But now, by the way, I got another guy like that, another guy we, that we picked out, worked on him, and he got saved about a year ago. Now, I, I, gave, I could give you a story about it. A real interesting story about how he got saved. But anyway, he got saved, he was 85. But my point again is this, is nowadays things have changed. So I recognize that. People, it's not as easy to talk to folks about Jesus as it used to be. I understand that. But my thing is, that doesn't change my obligation to love them and care about their person soul. And, and I'll tell this story. My son grew up in church. And I prayed with him and baptized him when he was probably about 12, 13 years of age. He didn't get saved. He prayed the son's prayer. He didn't get saved. A lot of folks do that, by the way. And I, if, you, if you saw his life when he got out of, out of under my thumb, you know he didn't get saved. But at any rate, but while he was out in the world, I prayed this a lot of times. You know, here's, I could not bear the thought. I could not even bear to think about the fact my son dying and going to hell. In my mind, I could see my son in the flames of hell screaming up to me, Daddy, help me. And Daddy can't help him. And he just tore me apart. And so I, I prayed many times, God, please put somebody in my son's path today. Because he, he didn't live in my home, my town. He lived 100 miles, 500 miles away. God, please put somebody in my boy's path today that cares enough about his soul to talk to him about Jesus. Well, you know, the guy across the street or the lady across the street, it may be have a mother praying or a daddy praying just like that. And you might be that person that God wants to put in their path to talk to him about Jesus. But you know what? I've got to care for somebody I've got, got to pick me out somebody out there and say, that's mine, Lord. And it, 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 if you'll help me, I'll love them to Jesus. I can't drive them to Jesus. I can't make them get saved. But I can pray them and love them to Jesus. And so may God today put somebody on your heart. What would happen to Mount Lebanon Church, by the time you move into a new building, if, if all of us got somebody on our heart and began reaching those people and getting them in church. See, now my, my point is this. If I get that guy saved, he's got unsaved friends. It opens the door. The more I win, the more I can win. The more new converts we make, the more new, new converts we can make. 
Every new convert opens the door for other converts. You know what I mean? Here's what happens to us as Christians. And here's where, here's where most of us live. Christians live in a Christian bubble. We hang out with Christians. We go to a restaurant with Christians. We visit in Christians' home. And the unsaved world is walled out of our life. We live in a bubble. So they die and go to hell while we, we eat out and enjoy ourselves. Somehow we've got to break out of the bubble. Somehow we've got to break out of the Christian bubble. We're going to go out where they are and find them and love them to Jesus. And, and, and again, uh, I, I, I've got folks right now that are dear to my heart. If I could, I'd beat them and make them get saved. I'd just get a ball back so you ain't going to get saved and hit you in the head. But it doesn't work, amen? All of us probably got folks like that, close to us. But I can love them to Jesus. And by the way, sometimes they're very unlovely. And sometimes they hurt you. I've got someone dear to my heart right now that, that has really... Anyway, we don't need to go there, but I, I've been hurt. But you know what I've said to Jesus? Lord, please help me not, not to get angry with that person. Help me to do what Jesus would do to that person and forgive them. And Jesus looked down from the cross and said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Give me that mindset toward that person and help me to love them like Jesus would love them. And so I, I know all about the thing about talking to folks about Jesus and folks getting... I understand all that. But that does not alleviate me when he said to me, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go therefore make disciples of all nations. And so, either I say, Lord, I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to disobey you. I'm just going to live for myself and live my own little world. Me and, me and my four are saved and the rest of the world can go to hell. Now, we don't say that, but we imply that. And so, God has to stir us. And so I, I, I just want to, to kind of stir the church today by the, the Spirit of God to stir the church today to say, look, God's, God's gonna, if God blesses us to move into a new building, we need to have a heart that says, I, I'm not, now if you come from another church and want to join my church, if you're a Christian believer and want to accept our belief system, you can join. That's not the way to build a church. Build church by getting people saved. Otherwise, I'm just swapping fish from one tank to another. I'm not, I'm not building the kingdom of God by doing that. I want to see I want to folks born into the kingdom of God by the new birth. Amen? Nothing adds an excitement to a church like new converts. We all know that. They bring a zeal and excitement that we don't have. Every church needs to have new converts sitting on the pews. It, it brings this... It, it brings fresh blood, fresh excitement to the church house. And so God give us a heart and a passion for the perishing souls of men. Uh, I wonder today, how has it been since we spoke with anyone about the Lord? And I know, you know, um, there's no such thing as a professional Christian. Uh, there may be professional, uh, but my point is this. Your preacher and I live in the same body you do. We fight the same battles you do. And uh, the devil would like to get us all so busy, we don't have time to talk to folks about Jesus. By the way, doing good things. We can, we can get busy doing good things for Jesus and get sidetracked from our main calling. So, God help us keep the main thing, the main thing. Amen? God help us at Mount Lebanon Baptist Church keep the main thing, the main thing. So, Lord, you know, I, I do this all the time before I'm pastoring right now, interim pastor. I preach through the Gospel of Mark. I read the story about Jesus feeding the 5,000. I say, now, folks, listen, when you read the Bible, you've got to talk to the Bible. And I say, now, Lord, you put that in there about you feeding the 5,000. By the way, that means 5,000 heads of household could have been 20,000 people. He said, now, I said, here's my thing. 
I got to say, now, Lord, why'd you put that in there? You, you're telling me something. Now, what are you trying to tell me when I read that passage? There's a lot of things that's in there, but my point against this is, so my thing is, uh, so God, you, you, you give me a, a new church building. And, and, and now, Lord, why are you putting us in this new building? You know what I'm talking about? Uh, what are we going to do with it? Are we just going to enjoy it for ourselves and be selfish and let the world die and go to hell? I don't think so. Amen? We're not going to do that. We're going to do our best to reach out to a perishing world. Amen? In order to do that, we've got to figure out some ways to get the gospel to our community and impact our community. And one of the ways I can do that is picking me out somebody, ask God to put them on my heart, and let me take them. And Lord, that's mine. And I'm going to claim them for Jesus. And I'll, be, I'll love them. I'll take them out to lunch. I'll visit with them. I'll be their friend until I can love them to Jesus. And God can use your life to do that. I wonder this morning if you would just take a moment. Just kind of bow your head. <clears throat> Is there anybody in your circle of friends that you know of that's lost, that you have a, a relationship with, that you could pick and say, Now, Lord, I want to claim that soul for Jesus. And I want to do what I need to do to win them to Jesus. Probably everybody here right now has got somebody on your mind that you know about, that you could, that you, by the way, you may be the only person that can talk to them. A lot of folks won't talk to the preacher, but they'll talk to you. But is there anybody in your circle of friends that's lost that you could reach out to today? Would you claim them? Would you claim them for Jesus and say, Lord, by your help and by your grace, I'm going to pray and love that person into the kingdom of God. You just give me the wisdom to know how to talk to them and share my testimony with them and bring them to Jesus. Father, as we bow our heads, I pray you speak to every person here. And Lord, there may be somebody here that doesn't know you. They want to give them an opportunity right now to come to Jesus. As Lord, as we bow our heads and as we wait before you, we must ask the Holy Spirit to do what only He can do. That's melt hearts and change lives. So Lord, do your thing in our midst today. We welcome you to our midst. We thank you for your presence. And move in our hearts and change us today. As heads are bowed, as we wait before the Lord, if you're here today and you don't know the Lord as your personal Lord and Savior, I want to invite you to Jesus this morning. I want you to invite you to trust in Jesus. As our heads are bowed, if you're lost, if you'll pray this simple prayer, God will save you right now. If you'll just simply say and mean it from the depths of your soul, Dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know you died on Calvary's cross to pay for my sins. And I thank you for dying to pay for my sins. Today I'm going to repent of my sins. I'm going to ask you to come into my heart and forgive me. I'm going to trust in you as my resurrected, living, glorified Lord to save me and pay my sin debt. I accept you now as the Lord of my life. If you'll do that, God will save you right now at this moment. Father, again, we ask you to speak to hearts. Holy Spirit, you do what we cannot do. And so, Lord, we just place it into your hands. Speak to hearts. And may we leave this place, Lord, different than we were when we came. And give us a fresh passion for the perishing souls of men. In Jesus.